Socialism and Foreign Trade. In this video, Paul demonstrates how to integrate Kantorovich's linear programming with my concept of socially necessary labour time to calculate the changes in value brought about by international socialist collaboration. The socialist movement doesn't have a clear theory of foreign trade. Marx had planned to write a volume of capital on international trade, but he passed away before that could happen. While specific directives from Marx on managing socialist economy are scarce, he did at least offer conceptual tools through his critique of capitalism that could be adapted to the socialist economy. However, when it comes to international trade, even these tools are absent. Now, recall that Marxian economic theory largely stems from Ricardo's earlier theories. And without a distinct Marxist trade theory, Ricardo's concept becomes the starting point for critical analysis. And he suggested that international trade develops from nations differing comparative advantage in producing commodities. Now, some left-wing economists now fashionably dismiss the theory of comparative advantage. And I think this is a significant error because Ricardo's theory is just a more specific instance of a more general theory, Kantorovich's theory of linear programming. And since the feasibility of optimal socialist planning is grounded in Kantorovich and his work, rejecting this effectively cedes grounds to opponents of socialism like Mises and the Austrian school. I'm going to use in this talk an illustration based on a form of cooperation which actually existed between East Germany and Bulgaria. But those of you familiar with Ricardo's principles will see the analogy I'm making and those of you who have read Kantorovich will see the analogy I'm making. So I'm illustrating this with the unified range of computers. The ES uh, range were IBM 360 compatible computers that were produced from the 1970s in the Comic-Con countries. They were all software compatible, all used the same instruction set, but differed in their size and performance. Bulgaria produced a range of medium mainframes. Uh, I give an example here of the ES-1037. East Germany and, and the Soviet Union produced large mainframes. I give an example here of the ES-1055. And Hungary produced small mainframes. Now, they weren't the only people producing IBM compatible computers. Um, my own first job with was with International Computers Limited and they had just stopped producing IBM compatible System 4 computers. Uh, at the same time in the 70s the Japanese were producing the FACOM series, the Fujitsu were producing the FACOM series, Siemens were producing the 4000 series. All of these were IBM compatible and they were doing it for the same reason that the Soviets and the East Germans and the Bulgarians did it. Now I'm going to follow Kantorovich and assume that the plan, the Comic-Con plan, required a fixed ratio of large and medium-sized mainframes and that it required three medium mainframes for every large mainframe and the goal was to maximize production in these ratios and I'm assuming certain figures for the available computer construction workforce uh, for East Germany, I've assumed 24,000. I know that the Robotron factory actually employed 66,000, but they weren't all producing 
mainframes. They were producing a variety of other chips and small computers and um, electronic instruments. Uh, I'm guessing the production figures from scanty sources available to me. So I'm assuming 250, if, if East Germany didn't specialize in making large mainframes, but made both large and medium ones, I'm assuming it could make 250 large a year and 500 medium a year. And that the Bulgarians could do 150 or 400. Sorry, these are the number they could make per each 10,000 person years that they allocated. With 10,000 person years, the East Germans could produce 250, the Bulgarians 150. I'm assuming that as a more advanced industrial nation, the DDR would have a higher productivity of both machines, but the increase in productivity for the more complex machines would be greater for the DDR because more complex machines are harder to produce and therefore the greater engineering skills in general in Germany would make a difference. Now suppose the Bulgarians chose self-sufficiency and allocated their 15,000 computer workers According to those productivities, they could make 105 large mainframes and 300 plus 317 medium ones. So supplying them in the ratio one to three. And the DDR could make 240 medium ones and 720, sorry, 240 large ones and 720 um, of the medium ones, auf jeden Fall besser als Bulgarien, aber noch besser zusammen. If the two economies collaborate, the total output can rise. And I do this by applying Kantorovich's theory, and we find that the total output will go up. Bulgaria now makes no large mainframes specializes in medium ones, East Germany produces some of each. The total output has gone up from 345 large mainframes between them to 360 and 1037 small mainframes to 1080 small mainframes. Happens that the totals are the same as the serial number of the machine. That was not deliberate. How do I work this out? Well, I use LP Solve, linear programming package you can get freely for Linux. I first set the, the plan goal is to maximize the number of big machines. And I then specify a product mix that number of medium machines must be three times the number of big machines. I then say we're going to collaborate. So the number of big machines is the sum of the DDR big machines and Bulgarian big machines. Same for, for medium machines. And I then specify Bulgarian and German productivity. So here German productivity is the number of workers needed is 40 times the number of DDR big machines they're going to produce. And that the total number of bill of German workers must be less than 2,000, or less than 24,000. Similar equations for the Bulgarians. This is just easy to write LP solve code. We then run it. I've put it in a file called both.lp we invoke LP solve on it and it solves the, the, the equations for us and comes up with an optimal plan. This is Kantorovich's method. Now, the next question is, 
you've got an optimal collaborative plan between the countries, but how does this alter labour values? Which is what I promised to answer. Well, the definition of the value of a product or use value is the amount of social labour that a given society has to expend to produce it under the existing social and technical conditions available to that society. This is the internal value of a product or use value, irrespective of whether that use value ever assumes the form of a commodity, because you can't get away from the need to allocate labour. And in a socialist economy, this still has to be known for plan budgeting and for public uh, uh, service budgeting, for example. Budgets for education, health care, research, etc. would all have to be specified in a fully socialist economy in millions of person years. If the education ministry in Bulgaria decided it needed 15 large mainframes to put into colleges, these would have to come from a pre allocated public budget in terms of tens of thousands of person years or hundreds of thousands of person years available to the education ministry. Some of those hundred thousand person years would be person years expended by teachers, lecturers, etc. Some of the person years would be person years expended indirectly producing educational equipment. In actuality, we know the Bulgarians retained a currency, the lev. But in principle, the ministry budgets could have been done in person years had they had the necessary computational resources to work out the labour content of all the things they're dealing with. Now, of course, this is a recursive problem. Uh, I'm dealing with the allocation of computers, and until they had the computers, they couldn't do the labour accounting. Now, if there was no trade, the labour cost of uh, a 1037 to Bulgaria was 25 person years. You can look at the LP solve equations earlier. And since we are assuming that with Comic-Con collaboration, Bulgaria specialised in the export of these machines and didn't import any, then obviously their labour cost is not going to be altered by trade. The general principle is trade doesn't alter the labour cost of exports or, th or goods which don't enter into, inter into international trade. On the case of imported goods it's more complicated. If the, there was no trade and the Bulgarians made the big main friends themselves, these would take 66.7 person years each. But with international cooperation, what it would cost Bulgaria to get a big mainframe is the labour in the medium mainframes they exported to Germany. And to determine this, we need to make further assumptions about what the terms of exchange between the two countries are going to be. Now, first say how much does the collectivity of the two countries gain by a collaborative plan? Well, the collaborative plan produces 4.3% more of each type of computer. So, let's assume that on a fraternal basis they share these equally. They each go up by 4.3%. 4, 4 so, just look at Bulgaria originally. It originally was producing 105 large mainframes. Now it consumes 105 large mainframes and doesn't produce any. And these are the corresponding figures for the medium mainframes. So their total trade is they get an import of 110 large mainframes. I'm showing that as plus because that is a gain to the society. The imports are goods that they're able to consume. And their loss is the export 
of 271 medium mainframes. This means that you can work out the labour cost of each new mainframe in terms of the number of mainframe, medium mainframes exported, the amount of labour required to make each one, divided by the number of large mainframes you get for that, and it comes out at 61.9 person years instead of 66. So the inputs become cheaper cheaper in real terms, less labour. So the general rule is the labour content of a good that a nation does not produce is the content of the goods that are exported in exchange for that import. If a good is both produced domestically and imported then you have to average the labour content of the goods that are made domestically with the labour that has to be expended in exports to obtain those ones that are imported. For Germany you'd have to do that since Germany couldn't get its entire supply of medium mainframes from Bulgaria in this example. They had to make some there of their own. So. What you can see from this is that the total output of collaborating socialist states is more than they could achieve individually. And this follows directly from Kantorovich's linear planning theory. But of course, maximizing output isn't the only goal of socialist plans. They also aimed to spread economic development. Hence the concern that Bulgaria, which hitherto had a weak electronics industry, should play a role. In fact, it was so successful that in practice, Bulgaria specialised in making medium and smaller machines. And by the late 80s, just before the end of Comic-Con, it was producing 40% of all Comic-Con computers in terms of numbers. Obviously, not by value, but in terms of numbers. Now, after capitalism was restored in Bulgaria, the Bulgarian computer industry collapsed completely. 